will come to order. And uh, of course, uh, for the third day, uh, our, our caucus is meeting, although uh, I think it's about to, to end. And so I hope we'll be joined by some other members of the caucus soon. And uh, we are fortunate to have Mr. Klein. In a moment, I'll recognize myself and the ranking member for up to seven minutes for purposes of making our statement. I will recognize uh, the chairman and ranking member of the Middle East South Asia Subcommittee for three minutes opening remarks, and then all other members will have an opportunity to make one minute opening statements if they wish to do so. Um, members may also place written statements in the record. And before I begin the uh, opening statement, I'd just like to say a few words of the committee. Um, uh, we're coming to the end of this Congress. Uh, I. I hope, I expect, I intend for there to be one other hearing during uh, this session, hopefully uh, the first week of December, a hearing on the implementation of Iran sanctions. Uh, and uh, it was our intention to have such a hearing. Uh, uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that legislation is one of the things I think uh, we can rightfully be proud of accomplishing in this past uh, uh, Congress and there are other issues as well, but I'm not going to belabor all of that at this particular moment. Uh, and I do want to say to my ranking member, uh, uh, I do think we've accomplished a number of things together. And while we haven't agreed on absolutely every single issue, you've been a, a very good partner, a spirited partner. And uh, and I look, f um, I don't want to be presumptuous in creating any presumptions, because I know these decisions haven't yet made. But were such a decision being made, I would look forward to working with you uh, for two years in your new capacity and my new capacity, if I could afford to be presumptuous um, uh, about my own situation. So uh, we do, we have a, a number of colleagues on the committee who will not be here. Uh, uh, again, because we have a caucus who will not be here in the next Congress, I would like to mention them, but since they're not here, I'm just going to mention one of my dear friends and I think a great member of the committee who will not be with us in the next Congress, uh, Congressman Klein, who's made a tremendous contribution to the product of this committee and to the Congress. And I think all of us, and I know the ranking member from our earlier conversations over the years, uh, shares the feeling of we will be we will miss having you here very much, and uh, Congressman Klein. Um, uh, I will now begin the opening statement. Uh, the hearing will, this hearing will delve into a subject, and I apologize to the witnesses for the delay, uh, uh, a subject that not too long ago was at the very top of our foreign policy agenda, the Iraq and the U.S. role there. U.S. military forces currently face a December 31st, 2011 deadline for a complete withdrawal in accordance with the 2008 agreement with the Iraqis. As a result, the primarily Defense Department-led military campaign is being transformed into a diplomacy assistance and advisory effort led by the State Department and USAID. This transition is unprecedented in terms of its sheer complexity, the resources required to do it right, and the likely consequences of failure. As part of this transition, the State Department will be expected to manage a number of specialized security-related tasks, often with the use of contractors, that in the past were handled exclusively by U.S. military forces. These include operating early warning radar systems that alert our personnel to incoming rocket fire, handling unexploded munitions that land inside of U.S. compounds, running unmanned aerial surveillance, and recovering down vehicles. The State Department's largest program in Iraq will, is now and will continue to be police training. But the challenges facing the department in this area will become even greater with the launch of a new advanced police training and reform program and with the handoff of some training responsibilities from DOD. In order to monitor political, economic, and security developments in Iraq, identify potential threats to U.S. interests before they emerge, and effectively engage with key political players, the State Department also plans a significant expansion of the U.S. diplomatic presence in Iraq. In addition to our embassy in Baghdad, which is already by far the largest staff of any U.S. embassy in the world, 
State is planning to open four other diplomatic posts, consul, consulates general in Basra and Erbil, and temporary posts called embassy branch offices in Mosul and Kirkuk. The U.S. transition is proceeding in a difficult and dangerous setting. Iraq's failure to form a workable governing coalition promptly after the elections has complicated and at times worsened the security environment in which state is assuming the responsibilities once held by defense. Our diplomats and, develop, our diplomats and development professionals in Iraq face, uh, continue to face significant perils with insurgent rocket fire sometimes targeting the embassy compound. Movements of U.S. officials outside their facilities often require security details of up to 20 or 25 people. And with the host country currently unable to provide the security and services routinely offered in most nations, the security environment may become even more treacherous after the withdrawal of U.S. forces. The transition from defense to state in Iraq is a massive undertaking and it won't come cheap. But by any calculation, the costs associated with an increased State Department presence pale in comparison to the resources we expended in Iraq through many, so many years of war and terrorism. If funding this transition will help preserve the hard-won progress in Iraq and provide a solid foundation from which the United States can support Iraq's internal stability, foster a peaceful Iraqi role in a strategically critical region, then it's likely to be worth paying the price, even in these difficult times. I have a number of questions about the transition. How have Iraqi political problems been affecting transition plans and the security situation of our personnel on the ground? How often and under what circumstances will our diplomats be able to move around the country? What do they expect to accomplish after the U.S. military departs Iraq? How will our diplomats Civilian professionals, contractors, and facilities be protected if U.S. troops are not at hand. What can we expect from the government of Iraq in terms of protection of our diplomatic establishment? How is state responding to concerns over shortcomings in past management and oversight of its programs in Iraq, as raised, for example, by the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, particularly as state plans to ramp up use of private contractors to provide both security and life support services? And finally, the big question that I hope our witnesses from state and defense will address head on, what are the consequences for U.S. national security if we shortchange the transition effort? In a world where Congress is gonna have to make very, very difficult budgetary choices, why should funding the transition be a high priority? How will a robust civilian presence in Iraq after 2011 serve the larger national interest? What is the administration's long-term vision for U.S.-Iraq relations? Regardless of how one feels about the origins of the Iraq War and U.S. policy in the last decade, these complicated issues challenge all of us to look ahead in a bipartisan manner at the kind of strengthened U.S. civilian presence in Iraq that can advance our interests and enable us to stand with the Iraqis who are fighting extremism and trying to develop their country. In a moment, I'll introduce our witnesses, but first to the ranking member and presumptive chair of the next Congress, Ileana Ross Layton, and for any opening remarks that she might have. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I also would like to uh, begin my statement by thanking uh, three departing members from our side, uh, from our committee, Senator-elect uh, Bozeman of, uh, of Arkansas, and uh, two gentlemen from uh, South Carolina, Mr. Barrett and Mr. Inglis, and we will miss them, and we thank them for the great service uh, to our committee. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, timely hearing today. The U.S. mission in Iraq is in a time of transition. Embassy leadership has rotated twice since the committee last received testimony from both the Department of State and the Department of Defense. A more fundamental transition is now underway as the U.S. combat mission in Iraq ended in August 2010 and the U.S. role shifts further. As a result, while I respect and admire our, and thank our witnesses for their record of service to our, to our nation, it is difficult to understand, Mr. Chairman, why the administration declined to send higher ranking officials from the State Department and the Defense Department to a full committee hearing on a matter as important as Iraq and future U.S. policy. I'm concerned that such a decision reflects a broader strategic ambivalence in the policy and our approach to Iraq. 
We owe it to our troops who have sacrificed so much in the course of their mission in Iraq to ensure that, that a strategic defeat does not spring from their hard-fought tactical victory. Unfortunately, for most of the last two years, much of the focus has been on dealing with short-term considerations such as drawing down troop levels quickly without sufficient focus on the emergence of Iran as the key power broker in the country or the long-term security applications and situations or the nature and the extent of future U.S.-Iraqi relationship. We do have a strategic framework agreement with Iraq, uh, but what is the administration's strategy for moving this effort forward? We must be both uh, proactive and perspective. Iran and, uh, I mean, Iraq can play a critical role in, uh, in limiting the Iranian influence, uh, which have, as all of us know, has been uh, destabilizing in the region and Iran's ability to threaten and intimidate its Gulf neighbors is uh, well documented. So a stable, secure, and friendly Iraq can help separate Iran and Syria, can provide Turkey with a key alternative to economic involvement with Iran, can demonstrate to the Gulf states that Iran cannot dominate the northern Gulf, nor can it expand to the south, and finally, a friendly Iraq can help our key allies in the region. I would ask that our witnesses uh, uh, um, address this question, if they agree that uh, greater U.S. leverage in Iraq can play a critical role in limiting Iran's influence and Iran's ability to threaten and intimidate its neighbors. And what specifically is the United States near uh, uh, and, and also far-reaching and long-term strategy for addressing the Iranian threat in Iraq. Would you agree that a stable, sovereign, and secure Iraq will show that Sunni and, and Shiite Muslims can cooperate and can diffuse the threat of Sunni extremism, as well as the kind of Shiite extremism backed by Iran? And going one step further, we've got to recognize that Iran's activities in both Iraq and Afghanistan are components of a broader threat that it poses to U.S. interests and allies in the Middle East and beyond. The need for a sound, comprehensive strategy has never been more vital as we transition our presence to an overwhelmingly diplomatic one. And as Iran seeks to exploit that transition period, to draw the recently formed Iraqi government under its thumb. We may still be able to achieve a lasting grand strategic victory, but not if we treat Iraq as if there were some sort of end state rather than the need for a continuing strategic focus. And finally, Mr. Chairman, given the need for full oversight of our Iraq policy, I'm concerned about news that the State Department has failed to comply with repeated requests by the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction for contract data on the Iraqi police training program. Given the troubled history of our police training efforts there, the need for oversight of this program is particularly important so that we do not repeat past mistakes. I share the concerns that were raised by Senators Grassley and Coburn in their October 6th letter to the Secretary of State about the continued failure of the uh, Bureau to uh, take immediate steps to address the lack of cooperation with the uh, Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. What guidance has been given employees of the uh, Department of State in regards to responding to requests uh, made by Seeger to uh, ensure that the unanswered request for information does not continue? what has been done by both state and DOD to implement the recommendations set forth by SIGER. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to express concern regarding the plight of the residents of Camp Ashraf. Mr. Chairman, last year you and I issued a joint statement urging the Iraqi government to live up to its commitment to ensure the continued well-being of all who live in Camp Ashraf. However, reports indicate that denied medical care, including vital treatment for cancer patients, 
are still being denied to the residents of Ashraf. And uh, Secretary um, Feltman, I would uh, urge the Department of State uh, to please intervene more proactively to ensure that the humanitarian protections uh, to which Ashraf as residents are entitled and were promised are going to be upheld. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank the witnesses for their time. Look forward to hearing from, uh, from them about the administration's plans going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. ross Leighton, and uh, uh, we, are, we are now, I hate to tell you, going to have a series of five votes. As soon as that fifth vote is cast, I will come back here and uh, talk among yourselves or whatever. Uh, I, I just saw one thing, though, since uh, the ranking member raised it. I want to reaffirm the notion that the commitments on Camp Ashraf that were made by the Iraqi government and all that, I, I share the concern that those are kept and that uh, we not forget about uh, that issue. And uh, with that, the committee will recess until the, uh, we finish the vote somehow. House 4. Thank you.